Hi, welcome to the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast, where we meet leading investors and commentators and educate ourselves about the world of investing and the world. Our mission is to remove some of the mystique around investing and improve our understanding of what makes a successful investment or indeed an unsuccessful one. Our goal is to inform, educate and entertain. We hope you enjoy this and every episode. Behind the balance sheet and affiliates and podcast guests may own shares or have an economic interest in securities discussed in this podcast, which is aired for your education and entertainment only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice or relied upon for investment decisions. Always do your own research. Barry Ritholtz hosts one of the most popular business podcasts in the world. He rather modestly says he was one of the first. He's not only managed to interview investing heroes like Ed Thorpe, Ray Dalio twice, and Michael Lewis four times, but he's also built a $3 billion wealth manager in just 10 years. In this interview, Barry explains why financial TV is irrelevant, why the FIRE contingent, that's financial independence retire early, why they've got it wrong, why 70-30 should be the new 60-40, why investors should think in decades, how he can call Mike Bloomberg dude and not get fired, and what it's like to have broadcast over 400 shows. I hope you enjoy this episode. Barry Ritholtz, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited because I've been, lo- I've been looking forward to this. Well, I'm excited to be here. It's, it's a Friday. It's been a busy week, month, quarter. I'm looking forward to uh, Q4. So listen, you are one of the top podcasters in the finance and business space, and you're one of the top wealth managers in the US. How did you get started in wealth management and in podcasting? It all, I think I think there is some um, advantage to longevity. So you say top, I say first, one of the first. Uh, I started in the business as a trader. I was an attorney. I was I loved law school. I hated being a lawyer. It was not no fun. Um, and a buddy was running a trading desk for the predecessor firm to E-Trade. And I got a tour of, um, I had always been interested in markets and and corporate entities and stocks and things like that. Um, and my mom used to, was a stock dabbler. But uh, I got a tour of the trading room, kind of fell in love with trading and started started doing that. And it took about, I don't know, five years to figure out, uh, nearly five years to figure out, hey, this is fun, but it's too much fun to make a living with. And I really need to be more consistent. This up a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, down two hundred thousand dollars the next month uh, is is not a career. It's a hobby. And I felt, you know, I was always looking for a vein. I was always looking for that fix. And and you know, I I don't consider myself especially self aware. I'm I'm pretty oblivious. But having fallen down the rabbit hole of behavioral finance. Just because I was curious, how come the guy on my right is killing it this month and the guy on my left is getting killed this month? And then next month it switched. I have told that story too many times. Um, it, that's what sent me down. Um, for, first, it was um, How We Know It Isn't So by Tom Gilovich of Cornell. And then uh, some of the Tversky and Kahneman papers were online. And then Bob Schiller and Dick Thaler. And the next thing you know, it's just an endless rabbit hole. And this was late 90s before, you know, all the cool kids were doing it. And I credit that for making me self-aware enough to say, hey, you're doing this because you love the adrenaline. You love the dopamine hit, not because you're patient and are looking for your spots and can make a living at it. Um, You're doing it because it's way too much fun. Um, So since it was way too much fun, I said, if I want to stick in finance, I have to, you know, actually turn this into a career as opposed to a, um, you know, a roller coaster ride. And given my background, I had a lot of math and science in my background um, and I had gone to law school. So the thought of moving into the research and analysis side was was very attractive. I uh, got a job at a firm called Prime Charter as the research assistant to this just insane um, uh, the head of technology stocks, a guy named Lawrence Hart, who was a former software programmer for Bell Labs before it became Lucent. So just just one of these really fascinating guys. 
And I worked with everybody. I worked with the bond desk. I worked with the equity desk. I worked with the uh, retail stockbrokers. And that is what sort of launched the writing side of the career. And the writing side of the career eventually led to um, a run of different writings, uh, the street.com, then the Washington Post, and then Bloomberg. And when Bloomberg was, a lot of what I was doing was kind of pushed back to what I thought the mainstream media had had done wrong. And, and to wrap up this long ass answer to your question, most of the things I had done were in response to, oh, no, no, they're, I don't like the way they're doing it. Whether whether it's fair to call it right or wrong, I disliked it. So I didn't like the way the media covered economic news. And they used to just put a green reporter who didn't know better on it. Now that's changed. So I started writing about that and blogging about that. Um, when I launched the firm, the firm was launched because we didn't really like the way most of the industry was managing assets for clients. It was transactional. It was non-fiduciary. Um, it was really, you know, chasing alpha is a terrible way to run money for people who don't care about alpha. They just care about meeting their financial goals over the course of their lifetime, buying a house, retirement, paying for college, generational wealth transfer, philanthropy. None of those things require you to beat the market. And so having a core philosophy of low cost, passive indexing and goal focused rather than market alpha focused was a pushback to that. And and then lastly, the podcast this is absolutely a true story. I'm flying back from an event in Vancouver. Maybe it was like 2011, something like that, 12. And I had already done a couple of like um, just sort of fun podcasts. I, I did an interview uh, with Ned Davis and I did an interview with Felix Zuloff only because every time I would see them show up, they would get asked the worst questions and it was annoying. So I'm flying back from Vancouver to New York, and I don't remember if it was Toronto or Chicago. You have to change planes. And um, and I'm in the lounge waiting, and up on CNBC comes an interview with, I'm trying to remember, I think it was um, Bill Ackman, who or it could have been David Einhorn, but I'm I'm not positive. Well, Bill Ackman's always on CNBC. I mean, well, now, but back but then, I- but back then he hardly did it, and and- I was watched this interview and I slowly did like a slow burn. I'm like, those are the dumbest questions. Uh, what's your favorite stock? When's the Fed going to cut? Where Where's the market going to be in a year? Those, those questions have a shelf life of about 30 seconds. As soon as the guy walks out of the building, they're stale already because events change. So I, I, I like, I'm, I'm annoyed at this and I get on the plane and, end up sitting near somebody I know. And he's like, your forehead's all scrunched up. What's going on? And I relate the story and and they ask, well, what would you have asked? And off the top of my head, I reel off about a dozen questions, most of which are the end questions I ask people. What are you reading? Who are your mentors? Um, uh, uh, what sort of advice would you give to someone who wants to get into your field or just graduated? What do you know today? You wish you knew 25 years ago Essentially, the idea of the of the whole podcast is um, tell us who you are and how they, you got that way. What makes your philosophy so interesting? And what can the rest of us learn from you? Not what's your favorite stock pick on September 30th at 10, 14 a.m., which literally <laughs> is good for 30 seconds. When did you start the firm, the wealth management firm? September 16th, 2013. We started on the 16th because we had to make sure our checks, which arrived on the 15th, cleared, because that was always a question. And um, we had uh, arranged for an October 1st office that the landlord let us in two weeks early. And so literally put all my stuff on on my chair. See this chair I'm on, this Herman or Embody? I, I have one in the office. Put my computer, my boxes on it, wheeled it out the door. On 40th and 5th, walked a few blocks to from 44th and 5th to park in 40th. And we literally, that's how we moved into the new office, literally that day. Left my re- uh, resignation letter on my desk and and me, Josh, Chris, and Mike slid into the new office um, like nothing happened. That's astonishing. In less than 10 years, you built up a firm with a couple of billion dollars of assets. Yeah, we're about $3 billion. I, I, if you catch me sort of side-eyeing to the left, I'm looking at Bloomberg, seeing where we are. Um, and I try not to pay attention during the day, but 
up 150, down 250, up 83 has been the futures this morning. So I can't help but just like, hmm. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is um, a, a lot of good luck. I was fortunate that I, I wrote a piece for the street.com towards the end of 06 called Cult of the Bear that basically took a um, very short research piece by Reinhardt and Rogoff called uh, A Look at Five Financial Crises. And, and those five crises, uh, Mexico, Sweden, uh, 29 U.S., um, Japan, and I don't remember the fifth one. Uh, but it was five crises, uh, financial crises, not you know run-of-the-mill sure. crises. And those five, the average turned out to be uh, stocks get cut in half or worse. Real estate drops 30% or worse. You know, uh, GDP does this, employment does that, consumer spending does that as best as they could, you know, figure out looking at historical data. That that short research piece eventually became the basis for the much more comprehensive and in-depth, uh, this time is different, 800 years of financial folly. But to me, the issue of if real estate falls 30%, and admittedly, real estate had this giant run-up, what does it mean for the economy? And more importantly, to investors and traders, what does it mean for the financial markets and earnings? And so I tried to reverse engineer the Dow 30. It was too much work to do it in, in the NASDAQ 100 or heaven forbid, the S&P 500. But I thought 30 Dow stocks, I could say, assume a 30% drop in home prices and, and sale volume. Uh, what does this mean for profits? And at the time, time, the Dow was filled with a lot of banks, some big tech companies, um, some some consumer companies. And so I just kind of wargamed out each company and, and ballparked it. I mean, nobody was pretending this was precise. It was just supposed to be an exercise. And the last paragraph, which I kind of threw in as an add-on, it was the least important part of this analysis, was... So, you know, here we are about 13,000 and the trend is in place. And so I would expect this rally to continue until eventually it runs out of steam. But reverse engineering a 30% drop in housing, assuming it takes place, you know, in less than three years, if it takes place over 20 years, I can't help you. But if it's two years, three years, I came up with a 9,800 number for the S&P 500, I'm sorry, for the Dow Industrials, and then said, well, if we break 10,000 from over 13, I think that line in the sand, you remember CNBC had the Dow 10,000 hats, which by the way, turned out to be a fantastic investment because they got to use it over and over and over again for, for a good long time, uh, at least in the late 90s, early early 2000s was uh, over 10,000, under 10, over 10,000. And so I said, Talk about pulling a number out from up your ass. I said, hey, break 10,000. It's going to cause a 3,000 point panic. I could have said 2,000. I could have said 4,000. It's a made up number. Um, and so that's how I came up with Dow 6,800. Nobody wanted to talk about the analysis, about Reinhardt and Rogoff, about real estate. It was, I participated that year in the Business Week annual forecast. And I'm like, all right, I, even though I don't have any idea on the timing, let's use these numbers just shake things up. And I had actually gone to the, the editors of Business Week. This is when they were a McGraw-Hill company before Bloomberg bought them and said, listen, you know, uh, my Dow 6800 isn't so much a forecast as a, you know, a theoretical what if you guys have mostly super bullish people on. Why don't we run a big uh, 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 counter programming, just an article? Hey, here's everybody's talking about the best case scenarios. What happens if you know, the shit hits the fan. What happens if, if the worst case scenario happens? And and I'll never forget the editor says, listen, it's a giant double issue. We sell a lot of advertising. Do you want to participate or not? Sure, go ahead. Run those as my forecast, even though they're not my forecast. It's all anybody wanted to talk about. So in, in the, you know, the beginning of 2007, I did my usual circuit of TV and radio. I'll never forget Cudlow is like, you are the bottom of the pack, the lowest of the low. Nobody is even near you. Explain yourself. And so I explained what I just explained. And essentially, um, essentially, we end up with, you know, look, we're long. We're still we're still constructive on the market. 
but we're very unhappy what's going on in mortgages and real estate and derivatives. And, and we think this is a ticking time bomb. And I'm just waiting for a sign that the, the time bomb is, you know, that it's, that it's, it doesn't close one day at 13, four and open at seven. You'll be, there'll be plenty of warnings to get out, but I'm trying to give people a heads up. A storm is coming, pay attention. So the reason I tell that story is there's a lot of fortuity in that. There's a lot of good luck in that. I subsequently went on um, uh, Yahoo a couple of times with Henry Blodgett. When we broke 10,000, I had explained that story. Look, 6,800 is we panic after 10,000 and blah, blah, blah. And then in March 2009, I had gotten an email or something from someone at Yahoo. And I'm like, I hadn't responded in a while because I was busy writing Bailout Nation. But I just, you know, I, just one of those things, I, I reached out to Henry and said, hey, uh, I'm getting more constructive. I, I think people can cover their shorts and, and go long. You want to come on? Sure. So we, I go on Yahoo Tech Ticker back then and say, mother of all bear market rallies is coming. Close your shorts. You can put a toe in the water here. You can get long. And the next day was the bottom. The Dow was up a thousand points. And But you could have asked me that same question a month earlier, a month later, I would have given you the same answer. And the reason I bring that up is to just show how much, you know, random good fortune sometimes happens. After that, getting the top, getting the bottom and calling them both more or less right, you know, money just flowed in. And rather than take the easy route, hey, let's set up a two and 20 hedge fund and promise people we're going to manage their money really aggressively. Why don't we do the opposite? Why don't we be a fiduciary, manage money long-term, set up a financial plan for people. And the good the good fortune on the timing is this just shows you we have a model and a methodology and we're thinking about things. And despite getting the top and the bottom right, I don't want to run people's real money that way because you have to recognize how often you're wrong in those scenarios. And so a firm was launched. Um, it was a gra it was pretty gradual to get to a billion dollars, but we were just kiss just under it in around this time in 2018, when the fourth quarter whacked 20 percent off of equities uh, of 2018. And so we didn't quite cross a billion until 2019. And then we pretty much got 2020 and 21 dead right. And so lo and behold, Again, it's not that we're changing the portfolios or managing assets that way, but people are looking for an explanation, what the hell's going on and why? So the explanation in 2020 was, hey, all your local stores are closed. Why is the market going up? Well, all these companies are doing really well. Your local dry cleaner is closed. Your local retailer is closed. Your local whatever. But when you look at Apple and Amazon and Microsoft and Zoom and, and all those companies, they're doing great. And P.S., here's an analysis that shows 27% of the S&P 500 are these big tech stocks that are benefiting from work from home. What's doing really poorly? Well, hotels and airlines. And, you know, you could have taken the worst performing stocks of the S&P 500 and eliminated them, and it barely would have taken 6% off the S&P 500 market cap. It's tiny. The the worst, I think it was the worst 50 companies Um in terms of performance, we're barely 6%. So I, I think when when investors look at you, and even though you're not trying to time the market, even though you're not actively swinging in and out, if you could give them a reasonable explanation for what's going on, they're very, very comfortable. Let, last example. So I had previously written about war and other things and how it, it, it shouldn't be thought of. Whatever the market's doing previously, it's going to keep doing it. will wobble and then it'll go back to that. So I wrote a piece in the end of March 2020, don't assume uh, the pandemic ends the secular bull market. And uh, I think I got more hate mail for that piece than <clears throat> anything I've written. Uh, Bloomberg published this on, on April 1st. And just more like, is this an April Fool's joke? You're an asshole. You don't know what you're talking about. That lasted about, I don't know, eight weeks, six weeks, whatever. And, you know, we were back to break even by... Uh, late June, late July, something like that. And you know how the rest of the year, the S&P finished the year up 21%, 20%, something like that, and up 28% in 2021. Um, if you, and then when this year started, we just talked about mean reversion. If you take the, any previous rolling three-year average, we're way above average until this year. 
Now, the average of the past three years is about the historical average of eight, nine percent a year. So if you can make people say, look, I know this is scary and this is ugly, but you have to understand it's a feature, not a bug. Stocks go up and down. And here's how we're looking at it. it it's helpful. Um, people give their money to anybody. There's certainly enough competition, enough choices. I think people want to feel that their advisors know what they're talking about. They can answer their questions and and they have a good handle on, hey, what's really going on in the world? I don't know how the people who run money using astrology, and I'm not being sarcastic, I'm meaning <laughs> I know, yeah. zodiacs, I guess they attract people who are interested in astrology, but I have to see some evidence that the methodology is valid and not random. And, uh, you know, I got 0809 right. I got a, a bunch of other things right. And I don't want to run money based on my gut. And so I need to see something that's evidence, not, hey, this guy has a good feel for the market. Give him all our retirement money. That's a terrible way to manage assets. No, of course. And tell me, do you have a view on what do you do next? I mean, 60 40 doesn't seem like it's going to be a very reliable parameter for the next decade. I mean, have you got a better solution? Yes, I have this magic uh, derivative we created that'll outperform everything with no drawdowns and will beat all the... Um... Uh, so so in all seriousness, I think the problem with 60-40 isn't what most people think it is um, because suddenly bonds are attractive again. The, I, I wrote something earlier this week, farewell, Tina. There is an alternative now and you know, bonds at 4%. Uh, muni's at 5%, high grade, not high yield, high grade, corporates at 4 and 4.5%, 5%. You, you could get, now granted, admittedly, inflation is 6, 7, 8%, at least according to CPI. It's probably much lower when we look at gas, lumber, cop, go down the list of commodities and other things they've, they've plummeted. Before the pandemic, we were talking about 70, 30 is the new 60, 40, not just because bond yields are so low. That's not the reason. The reason is when 6040 came about, the what was the life expectancy in the US? 72? Like if you're a healthy human who didn't die in childbirth or during the pandemic, your life expectancy in the US is probably 80 plus. And if you have a decent portfolio, um, if you were high educated, upper income in a healthy environment, which doesn't describe the whole country, you're probably closer to looking at an 85 year. Um, lifespan. And so given that, you probably need more equities and less bonds in your portfolio. Um, but 90-10, 85-15 is a little crazy. 70-30 is probably the new 60-40. So that's the first thing to to recognize. The, the second thing to recognize is you, you have to really think about your contributions and, and how much further and longer you might be working. I am not a fan of telling someone who's 75, hey, you got to go back to work. But I am a fan of telling people in their late 50s, probably shouldn't retire if you're sitting on, you know, a million, a million and a half, two million dollar investment portfolio. You probably need double what you thought you did. And again, you don't have to work until your 70s. But, you know, all the people, the fire contingency who wants to retire in their 30s, 40s, 50s, um, there'll be plenty of time to, you know, retire when you're old and unable to work the way you can when you're younger, pile up some money. And I'm not saying, you know, work 14 hours a day and don't take vacations. But if you can earn a decent living in your 40s and 50s, you probably should think about working at least into your early 60s, or at least until you have enough money saved that you can retire comfortably without downgrading your standard of living. Say, I always find this the the fire continuing uh, is something of a mystery to me. So my father died within one month of retiring, and I, classic, you know, classic. So he he literally he went got his hair cut, paid his bookie, which was <laughs> the you know, and then you know, he lasted another day. And you know, I, I I mean, the thought of retirement, although you know, it sounds fabulous. I mean actually would horrify me i i like what i do i can't and i think there are lots of people who have got a skill and with you know modern technology being able to create content you can work for longer without 
you know, without having to commute to an office and do all the, so you do just the fun stuff. So I think people will want to work longer. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you but let's stick with that point. Cause it's so good. You need a purpose. You need a reason to get out of bed and golf probably isn't it for most people. And my mom passed away at 86 and a half. She was a collector of, of, uh, antique Judaica books and she just scoured the internet. I mean, in her 70s and early 80s, she was buying and selling these books all over the world, finding these books for 50, 100, $500, selling them for thousands of dollars. She was arbitraging books between Europe and Yale, between Europe and um, the Harvard Library. And, you know, you don't have to sell a lot of books to do that. But I'm like, Ma, how did you ever get into this? She goes, I, I can't play bridge and Mahjong every day. I need something to do. And, you know, that very much, she did that for 15 years. She was a real estate agent her whole, mo almost all of her adult life and, uh, or married life, I should say. And, um, and when she retired, so to speak, to Florida 20 years ago, she's like, I, I need something to do that's more important than, uh, I, I think we all do. I think there's a lesson um, with both our parents that you need a reason to get out of bed in, in the morning, not just I'm going to go out and go for a ride, maybe fish or play golf. That That's insufficient. Well, I, I suppose it also depends on, on the person. But tell me, when did you start the podcast? So you were so on that the, flight from Vancouver. When was that? So uh, I had been working. Um, uh, I had been a contributor basically everywhere. I was doing CNBC. I was doing Yahoo. I was doing Fox. I was doing CNN as a television guest. And CNBC made me an offer to be exclusive. It was really more of a demand than an offer. And I was not very comfortable with that. And as this is going on, uh, Bloomberg reached out for me to start writing for them. And they give me a tour of the place. And hey, here's our um, here's our, our television studios. Would you like a TV show? And my answer was no, financial television is awful. Um, you, nobody needs a TV show to watch paint dry or grass grow. But that's essentially, here's all this Sturm und Drang about the day-to-day when you have to think in decades or or years, what happened on a Tuesday is is not relevant to someone retiring in 2034. It, it doesn't mean anything to them. Uh, well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to sit down with successful, intelligent people and have an adult conversation about who they are and how they got that way. And I want it to be long form. And, and Bloomberg said, what, what do you mean? Like long form, like 10 minutes, 12 minutes? No, like two hours. And everybody laughed. And so they said, tell you what, we need 42 minutes for an hour of radio. You give us 42 minutes, right? Um, and we will uh, have a way to uh, turn that into a um, full um, hour. Traffic, sports, news, weather, commercials is an hour. If you go beyond the 42 minutes, we don't care. We'll just put the whole thing up on, on the website. And so we cut that deal towards the end of uh, the third quarter of 2013. And- we started recording them over the summer of 2014. The first year is pretty awful. Um, I go back every now and then and listen to them, and they're they're really horrible. Um, after you know nearly 500 of them, you get a little better. And uh, in the beginning, it was just me working my way through my contact list, my my personal Rolodex, friends, anybody I could talk into. Hey, I need you for 90 minutes. Can you swing by Bloomberg? Sure. And so the first year was pretty much that. Um, eventually, someone said, I can't help but notice that all of your podcasts are A, all of your buddies, and B, a bunch of white guys. Uh, yeah, that's because the only people I've been able to talk into coming. Well, you should think about trying to expand that. I'm like, all right, not a terrible idea. And I think it was the Bill Gross. I, I ended up getting a hold of the PIMCO bonus pool in 2014. 14, 15, something like that, and published it at Bloomberg. And it was like the most read story for six months. And, and you know, Bill Gross got a $300 million bonus that year, and Muhammad Alarian was 230 and, you know, down the list of everybody at PIMCO. And so um, back and forth with Gross after this comes out, and uh, he's like, you know, you've made it so I can't walk to the store to myself. I need bodyguards now. I'm like, uh, hey, you know, I I'll trade you. 
you lose the bodyguards, give me the 300 million. I'll, I'll deal with it. Um, I said, why don't you come on the show and tell, tell the story and tell what happened with Pimco. So he's like, uh, this is after he got fired. Um, he's like, sure. So he comes on when he was in town for the Barons um, round table. And uh, that burst the dam. People I'd been chasing for a long time said, yes, folks like Cliff Asnes and Bill McNabb of, of Vanguard and Asnes of AQR. And suddenly I'm getting these A-list guests. And, you know, it. at the time, Bloomberg had no podcast. This was their first podcast. Uh, and it blew up and and they kind of said, hey, maybe this podcast thing is is going to be big one day. And so they, uh, you know, they they podcast. I, I would like I like to say I podcastified Bloomberg. But the takeaway was, you know, in all these situations, be it the blogs or or um, writing for The Washington Post or uh, doing the show for Bloomberg or launching the firm. It's always about an opportunity presenting itself and how do you respond to that opportunity? Can can you, you know, take lemons and make lemonade? Can you take a little anger at the media for not knowing what seasonality is in real estate? I remember having an argument with the editors at the Wall Street Journal in, I don't know, 05. Ah, oh, we don't know why people are complaining about real estate. Look at how real estate has improved from February to March to April. It's gone up every month. And it's like, are you guys kidding me? Pull up any fucking year. Every year it does that. Here's a chart for the past 20 years. Look, every the real estate, why is that? People want to move into a new school district in order to get their kids to start the school year on whatever it is, Labor Day, September 1, whatever whatever your local start of the season is. So naturally, contract signings and closings peak in July, August, so everybody is in place for September. And look, it goes worse and worse and worse in the fall until it bottoms in December, January. And then January, February, it starts ticking up again. How do I have to explain this? You guys run the biggest me and now to their credit, um, all of the media, including the Wall Street Journal, has put much more senior people on it. It's no longer, you know, they I, I used to call it the the economic shtetl. They used to take the young green um reporters and and just put them in the ghetto of BLS and Commerce Department. It's it's close to every most of the time the numbers don't matter. It's you know there's a trend and the trend will continue over time. And it's only when you get to a major shift every you know three five seven years that it becomes interesting. Um, and and the, so the media has gotten a lot better. But when I launched the blog in like ninety nine on GeoCities and then two thousand three on TypePad and eventually. Uh, moved to my own domain in 08 uh, at WordPress. Um, that wasn't going on. And and I, I found myself constantly having to explain to people, no, what you read in, you know, fill in the blank, FT, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington. It's incorrect. And here's why. And, uh, you know, when when you have an opportunity, you have to find a way to to make the best of it. So another long ass answer to your question uh, the podcast launched the summer of 2014. We'll come back to the issue of media because I think it's, it's a fascinating time um, at the moment because, you know, there's a huge explosion in the amount of finance written on Substack, etc. But just on the podcast, it was interesting. You said, so 42 minutes to make an hour of radio. Your podcasts have got quite a variable length. So you, a short one will be 45 minutes. A longer one will be 75 minutes. Is, what's the best? What's the what's the best duration for a podcast? It just depends on the guest, right? Um, I think it's really a function of uh, a combination of the guest and the audience's tolerance to listen to my nasal drone for two hours. I, that that's the 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 combination. You know, there there is my dirty little secret about the podcast is I have an audience of one, which is me. Um, uh, people come listen. That's great, but. When I started, true story, um, there was a fund manager. I don't want to embarrass anybody, so I won't mention his name. But there was a fund manager I interviewed, I, I want to say 2014, 2015. And um, he's known for, for buy, uh, I, I actually, there's nothing embarrassing about it. I can talk about it. It's Ken Fisher of Fisher Investments. So he's written numerous books. He's the longest running Forbes columnist. And his focus is low cost stocks. He's always looking at 
you know, where can we find value in small cap stocks that have the ability to grow 10, 20, 30? So I do a whole interview based on his books and his writings. And uh, to be honest, it's a little dry and academic and and not very boring is the word I'm looking for. Um, and that's my fault, not his. And I, when we're done, I walk him over to the green room because he has to do TV next. And we start talking. And he says, um, he says, so how's it going with you guys? I'm oh, pretty good. We're around a couple of years. We're $400 million, blah, blah, blah. He And he, I'll never forget. He says, Wait till you're five years in a billion dollars and all of a sudden everything opens up. People who can't give you money will suddenly start talking to you and your average household size and account size will increase. Everything he says is was dead on. And so I said, well, you've been doing this a long time. How did you grow? And so we start having a the podcast after the podcast, which oh, I was- hate I hate when that happens. So I- I'm sitting there saying to myself, oh, did you crap the bed, man? The, you missed the right. This is the conversation, not the one before. So I say to him, I said, you know, uh, my bad. This is what we should have talked about. Not that that was bad. But um, but this is really fascinating stuff. And the next time you're here, I want to uh, the next time you're here, I want to have this exact conversation instead of having a conversation about um, just, you know, low priced value stocks. He said, sure. So I think it was like 18 months later, he came back and did the podcast we should have done the first time. And it was awesome. And if you listen to that podcast, it's like, wait, I have a guy who spent 40 years building a hundred plus billion dollar business. And I have him alone for two hours. If you listen to that, it's me saying, all right, you're my consultant named uh, Ken Fisher, who's running now. He's running, I think, close to 150 billion. And please spend the next two hours teaching me how to build a uh, billion dollar RIA. And and literally, like that's probably the most egregious example of me just not giving a crap and saying, I want to have this. Con this is the conversation I want to have. But I've been told from friends and family that you know, most of the podcasts are, are like that. If you want to use the word sincere, I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, they're, they're good because they're sincere. If you want to use the word selfish, I, I won't deny that because I'm asking the questions that I want to ask. Uh, there was a period where uh, every now and then I would ask Twitter, hey, I'm speaking to so-and-so, what should I ask them? And you get a handful of good questions, but most of the time it's like, uh, don't, don't bother me with that crap. So... <laughs> So we put a lot of time and effort and energy into researching. When I when I sit down with somebody, I know this person's life story as well as they do. And uh, the conversation is going to be in depth. And, you know, uh, a recent uh, an example that kind of cracks me up is pre pre Trump, I think I or maybe it was right at the beginning of uh, um, 2016 before he was elected. But when Scaramucci was supporting him. Mooch and I interviewed each other on two separate podcasts. And I said to him, so you're the guy who saved Dell. I never hear anybody talking about this. Let, let, let's discuss that. When you were a, a young Turk at Goldman Sachs, tell us how you saved Dell after their currency blow up. And there's like a long pause. He's like, how the hell do you know about that? Um, I Well, you and I have had drunken conversations where you alluded to it, but it's not private. It's semi-public. You just have to dig deep and find it. And we found it. And so he told the story about as a young guy in a trading desk on, on an investment banking desk, nobody at Goldman Sachs cared about Dell in, in the early 90s. They were small. They were not relevant. What do we want to waste our time with a $500 million company? Well, he did. And he's, you know, Dell, Michael Dell's been his client for you know, the 30 years since uh, it was a really interesting story. Michael Dallas had some very interesting people working for him. I just on a, a project with with a spin off of one of his um, offices, very, very talented people. But the um, so you've had a huge number of people on the podcast is partly about you, partly about the guest. You do a lot of work. I mean, how long does it take you to prepare for a podcast? So let's see. Um, I have a research assistant who puts a couple of hours in. If there's a book or two, I'll read all the books. If it's someone like a Howard Marks or Ray Dalio, I'll also read a couple of years of their quarterly or monthly research pieces. Um, 
the two things I really try desperately to avoid, I will not listen to a podcast they have done because I don't want to either purposefully or accidentally lift somebody else's question or go in an area that somebody else has, has gone. You know, one of the things that makes Masters in Business a little different than the typical podcast is that it's recorded for both radio broadcast. So Bloomberg has, you know, dozens of stations and thousand affiliates and XM satellite. So it's got to be recorded in four segments that are hard stop for broadcast. Seven minutes, six minutes, eight. Uh, I'm sorry. Seven minutes, eight minutes, 625, 1130 are the four segments. And so the, you know, the editors do a good, are the ones who make that tight and then whatever else is left over. And so that's allowed me to create sort of an arc of a narrative where it's intro and background, um, uh, what they're known for best in the second segment. The third segment is their book or whatever they're promoting at the moment. And the fourth segment is now apply all that to today and how does that work? And then the fifth segment is everything else plus my five favorite questions I ask everybody. That arc has kind of allowed me to say, here's how you're researching and writing questions. I don't read written questions. I kind of have topics and bullet points. And some of my favorite interviews are where it just goes off the rails and you kind of throw the script away. Chamath is probably a great example. He came out of the gates hot and I'm like, you know, I kind of just tossed the papers away and said, all right, let's, let's push back on this. Tell me about that. What about this? And it worked out, you know, that happens to be one of my favorite podcasts of, of the pandemic. Was that hugely listened to? Because I understand that his interview with Patrick O'Shaughnessy was like their top ever podcast. I don't know if it was the top one, but it was it was the biggest one of 2021. Um, let me double check if I got the date right, right on that also. You, um, I mean, you've had so, so many amazing guess that it would be very hard for somebody to you know to to stand out i guess but i mean you've got also a very wide range of people so you've got journalists you've got investors you've got venture capitalists you've got authors i mean private and- equity behavioral finance academics um ceos it, it's anybody that i think we can learn from and, and is interesting is who i want to speak to And so how do you choose them? So uh, there was a book, which was also a blog and a podcast a couple of years ago called You Are Not So Smart. And uh, David McRaney is the science journalist who was writing that. And then he did a subsequent sequel. I want to say that was like late 2000s, early 2010s. And the sequel to that was You Are Less Dumb Now. And (laughs) it's a little bit about behavioral finance and and, uh, fact checking and how to not let your biases and cognitive dissonance affect how you think. And here's how to be more right. Here's how to be less dumb. And um, he has a subsequent series of experiences where he comes to realize, hey, if you want to persuade people, if you want to change minds, fact checking doesn't do it. Wagging a finger at people doesn't do it. Calling people stupid. Hey, go figure. Saying to somebody, you're a fucking idiot is not going to change their mind, especially about a deeply held belief that is supported by their social community uh, and that is a core part of their intellectual uh, self of sense, sense of self. And, and so he starts researching anti vaxxers, flat earthers, Westboro Baptist people, anti LGBT marriage, and essentially stumbles into this really interesting and rapidly growing field of persuasion, influence, changing minds. Not the Bob Cialdini persuasion uh, discussion, which is a deep dive into how do people feel obligated? How do people uh, sort of make those, how, how how do salespeople successfully talk people into transactions? But if you're against marriage equality, you're against gay marriage, how can we persuade you that your position is not good? And so when this new book came out, um, How Minds Change, the Art and Science of uh, uh, Opinion, Belief, and Persuasion, right up my alley. I'm, uh, I'm going to read it. I reach out to him. Hey, when are you in New York? I'm in New York in September. 
great, let, let's get you on the show. Uh, it's that simple of Albert Wenger is a VC at um, Union Square Ventures. I've been tracing Fred Wilson for years. I have a couple of white whales. Uh, top of that list is Jim Simons. Next in that list is uh, Michael Bloomberg, who, when the podcast first launched, said to me, let me know when you get to 500 and I'll come do it. And so I'm I'm not that far away. It's like, hey, Mike, you said you would do it after 500. We're we're getting up there. We're pretty close. Um, and there's a handful of other white whales that that I've been been chasing. Um, but usually it's just somebody I want to sit down and have a conversation with. I was chasing Ray Dalio, no bullshit, for uh, almost a decade. I met him at some Bloomberg event before I was doing anything with Bloomberg. I want to say 11 or 12. And um, just just said, hey, it was a cra- whole long, crazy story. I'll spare you the details. Hey, uh, I just want to say thank you for being the only person on Wall Street who not only admits errors, but you know, starts, uh, uses this part of their process. This was pre-principles. And he turns to me and says, what do you do? And I start talking to him and he goes, how are you using this information? I said, well, I, I write a website and every year I publish my Mia Culpas. Here's what I got wrong last year and here's what I learned from it. And uh, so we start chatting. And, you know, when I finally got him five years later, when principles were seven years later, when principles came out, um, I had been chasing him for a couple of years and and I, I didn't know what his PR people were doing. They were always sending him to these like just weird, not good events. Uh, Ray is an interesting guy and you really need the right format to let him shine. And they just weren't doing it. And I was like, guys, I know his stuff. I've, I've read his works. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be so egotistical as to say nobody can interview Ray, but me, but I know him as well as anybody else. Please, please, please let me show you. And um, nowhere, went nowhere for three years. And then one day I'm on Amazon and, you know, new books coming out this fall. And there it is, Principles by Ray Dalio. I immediately shut off. Hey, this book is publishing September 30th. Let's get Ray in the middle of September and we'll we'll publish it. Uh, the podcast uh, the same day the book comes out. And they said yes. Um, and when, so we did a pre-call. And at the end of the call, I say, you know, you and I met at St. Pat's, I think at St. Paul's at a event. No, I have no idea. Oh, all right. So when he sees me at Bloomberg, now I remember you. Yes, I remember St. Paul's. Yeah. And he was a kind of difficult interview generally, but he was just so comfortable and relaxed. It was a fantastic conversation. So some of it is being prepared. Some of it is understanding when you have a guy who's or or a girl super intelligent or a, a little quirky and a little difficult um to get to relax you have to make them feel comfortable and so so that's part of my uh secret sauce you've had Ray Dalio on twice Michael Lewis on three times is that four correct? times uh four times. I, well three times plus I interviewed him at the inside ETF conference in Florida and we posted that as a uh as an ETF as a I'm sorry, from the ETF conference, we po- published that as a podcast. Um, I did um, a, a couple with uh, David Booth, and we published those, uh, plus one live with him and Gene Fama, and we published that as a podcast. I think I've done like three or four different remote ones that we've put up as as live podcasts. I did Ray Live, uh, and I did um, Howard Marks Live also. I've had Howard on a few times, and he's a, another fascinating guy. Yeah, he and and incredibly modest when you think about what he's achieved. It's uh, just uh, extraordinary how how humble he is. I love. I had I had to pull the story out of him, but in '07 they had just closed a new fund, like late '06, early '07, and as things get worse and worse, he reaches out to maybe it was oh late '05, early '06, and it was late '06, early '07. He reaches out. Well, it could have been late 07. He reaches out to his um, limited partners and says, hey, everything I look at in credit is going to hell. And I'm super excited that there's going to be an opportunity to buy distress, distressed credit at a once in a lifetime price. Send me a few billion dollars. And they did. And the numbers from that fund were like 19%. It's something insane for distressed fixed income. Um, again, life is about when opportunity presents itself 
rising to the challenge and and taking advantage of that opportunity. What was the Warren Buffett phrase? When it rains gold, put out a bucket, not a thimble. It's a very, it's just difficult to do. It's, you need to be, you need to be brave. So um, what is, um, I mean, apart from not coming on your podcast, what's Michael Bloomberg like to work for? <laughs> Um, He's my very favorite, generous, I believe. Um, yeah, the Bloomberg pays top dollar. The, the space, the Bloomberg HQ is, you know, absolutely a modern cutting edge building. The elevators go up to six in order to create that serendipitous collisions of everybody. Everybody has to pass through that floor. It's the floor where the famous food court is, the cappuccino makers, all the organic fruit, and they serve breakfast and they serve lunch. So if you're there at 7 a.m., there's, you know, yogurt, fruit, cereal. If you're there at noon, uh, and, and I, I knowing how they analyze data, I know that somebody has looked at those numbers and said, well, it costs us, you know, a million dollars a week, but we get $6 million in productivity. Um, I find my studio is literally right outside Mike's office, which is a, a cubicle. Now, he's got a bigger cubicle than most and a, a, a conference room and a a table and four assistants outside where he sits, but he's right there. And my favorite thing in the world, my favorite thing in the world is when I have a guest who I know either knows him or they've worked together, I'll circle around with one of his assistants and say, Hey, I have Ray Dalio here today. I'm going to, uh, he wants to say hi to Ray, to Mike. And one, <laughs> once the assistants goes, Oh, they saw each other at dinner the other night. They're fine. And I'm like, too bad I'm bringing him over. <laughs> and so I'll walk Ray over and I'll just I'll just sit there, let the two of them talk. And I am like, you know, the cat that ate the canary. They're they're talking and I'm just sitting there. Um, I did it. I must I must do it like every 10th interview. So I don't do it all the time. But uh Albert Wenger was somebody recently, um, because they've uh Bloomberg has a climate fund that they invest in and Wenger runs a climate fund also. I'm trying to remember um, Union Square Ventures is the name of it. I just think of it as USV and I have to remember what the acronym stands for. Um, and I've done it, you know, with with a bunch of people. And it's always it's always fascinating to he he's um, I, I think people are intimidated by him. And oh, I've sure. and I've interviewed enough Nobel laureates and billionaires and CEOs that I don't, give a crap. I, I don't really, you know. I, I I think the secret is if you treat them like a person and not like a celebrity, they they're appreciative of it. So I'm I'm prepping for a podcast the day after Bloomberg withdraws from the presidential race. And I, it, this is like, you know, pretty mid covid. Um, I'm in the building. It's late 2020 or it was during the, the window when. You know, before things got bad in the fall again. Yeah. Um, wait, he just stepped stepped out and endorsed Biden yesterday. What the hell is he doing here? So I run out of my studio and I'm like, Mike, Mike. And I, I go, dude, what are you what are you doing here? You you just have been on the road for six months. Why don't you want to take it to like go relax somewhere, go play golf? He's like, listen, it's a grind and this and that. But I, the way my process works is I need to get back into familiar circumstances, kind of find my level, be very comfortable. Then I'll take some time off. But he goes, I have other stuff planned in the future. I just uh, like I'm shocked that I'm getting this from him. And that thought comes into my head. If I, I'm having a conversation where, you, where I'm calling Mike Bloomberg, dude. Hmm. And he's like, oh, dude, what are you doing here? He's like, oh, I had to get back to work. I had to get back into the swing of things. That's how I, you know, that's how I find my my center, my normal. And we talk for five minutes. I'm like, and he's like, who do you have on this weekend? So I tell him, and I'm like, all right, well, see you around, see you around the building. And off he goes. And as I'm walking back to the studio, I'm like, did I just like really get myself fired? Or hmm. was that talking to him the way I would talk to anybody else? what he appreciates and and you know arguably if he had people around him who said hey here's what they're going to say to you and brace yourself maybe you went, would have gone further in the process so i i think people need to to be treated like normal human beings and not billionaire celebrities and hey one day that'll get me in trouble but so far you know well you so seem to be it's been working out yeah so you're still, you're still working there so you're, yeah. you're okay do you ever worry that you know, 
there'll be a, a, a backlash against Bloomberg because it's owned by one individual and it's acquiring, you know, a much greater presence, particularly in the financial media. So if I look at my country in the UK, um, Bloomberg has hoovered up some of the best journalists. Yep. And, you know, uh, in a time when the media is, is short of talent, short of money, nobody can compete in this space. Is that, is that going to be a problem? So there's no shortage of talent, but there is a shortage of money, right? Yeah. The problem is there are lots and lots of talented journalists, but, you know, local journalism is going away, replaced by, you know, Craigslist, eBay, you know, uh, Zillow and Carvana, all the things that used to drive, you know, remember, uh, journalism was driven by the business side, uh, which is advertising, classified subscriptions, et cetera. Um, Bloomberg has an advantage that its journalism is driven by a, a, a not inexpensive data service sold to Wall Street. And so the good news is they're doing amazing, amazing work. The The challenge for everyone else is what do you do if you don't have a $10 billion tech company attached to your journalistic enterprise? Now, in some instances, there's a benevolent overlord like Jeff Bezos in the Washington Post or arguably the Salzberger family in the New York Times. I actually, the two things I, I told Mike to do, by the way, he doesn't listen to anything I say. So I, I freely share my advice with billionaires and, and they ignore me. So once was, Mike, why don't you buy the New York Knicks? The Dolans are the fucking worst. I, I mean, they got lucky with hockey, but they don't know anything about running a basketball team. They're terrible. All of New York would love you, and it would only cost you a billion or $2 billion to do this. I have no interest in owning a sports team. Oh, oh, okay. The second idea was you should buy the New York Times, right, and and make Bloomberg the business section of the Times. And they're enormously influential, maybe not globally, but certainly in the United States. And um, you could turn them into a global entity. It's like, eh, I don't really care about the times. He goes, I looked at the FT at one point in time and we never, I mean, I think that that's pretty public that he uh, was thinking about taking a run at the financial times way back when, um, you know, to answer your question, he's a fascinating guy. He's really interesting. Um, he's in work every day, suit and tie. He is there every day. He is running the place. He is large and in charge and God bless him. I think he's almost 80. And, you know, there aren't that many people, late 70s, early 80s, who go into work because they love it. We this back to what we talked about earlier, yes. that that he wants to be there because it's what he loves to do. He's like he's teeing up the firm for when he's no longer coming in every day. Um, but he loves what he does and he doesn't. And you, you got to appreciate a guy who. Hey, this is what I do, and I'm I'm happy to happy to keep doing it. It's impressive. And do you think Substack and the growth of this sort of individual journalism? Do you think that's going to be a big thing in finance? I mean, is there, there are lots and lots of sub finance Substacks, but do you think it's enduring? So this, you know, the the pendulum swings back and forth time and again. So you go back 25 years ago, when financial journalism was pretty green, pretty naive, not very informative. Um, I don't want to say it was like a PR newswire, but it, it, it could have benefited from some experience and skepticism. And then go forward a, a couple of years later, and and there are lots of blogs and lots of other entities. Um, you know, the finance blogs really started in academia more than Wall Street. I, I was fortunate when I was working at a firm called Maxim Group that they let me publish every day. I mean, most firms would tell you they were running eight, seven or $8 billion. Most firms would say under no circumstances. Their rules were you can't make buy or sell recommendations for individual stocks in public. Other than that, you want to just bullshit about the economy, the markets, whatever, have at it. So, so I was really, again, another really lucky situation and and you take advantage of the opportunity. So back and forth with finance and, and journalism, and now you financial journalism gets much better. And then suddenly the business model changes, and now there are all these individuals. At the same time, the rise of um, propaganda, willful misinformation, 
trolling, uh, attempts to um, sell bullshit to the public, whether it's finance, political, NFTs, whatever it is, the ability to understand what is worth reading and what is not worth reading has always been challenging, but it's never been more important than today, and it's never been more difficult. So I get about a half dozen sub stacks, and there's a couple. Like I'll every time Sam Rowe publishes, I'll read it. Um, every time there's a Phil Plate of the Bad Astronomer publishes, um, I'll, I'll read that. But the other dozen or so sub stacks I get, it, it's just too much. And the problem with publishing on a daily or weekly basis is the name, the daily beast that must be fed. That That's where that comes from. You know, there are some times when you just ain't got a whole lot to say and there's no reason to publish just because the paper has to go to print every day at 3 a.m. But, but that's how we operate. So I don't feel like I'm being robbed if a Substack I subscribe to doesn't get me something twice a week if it's finance or market related, I feel they're being more respectful of my attention and limited time and basically saying to me, all right, we'll, we'll let you uh, do this when, when you can. But in the meantime, um, he, here's where you are and here's what, what uh, I think is worthwhile. So I agree. Yeah. I, I just don't know how this plays out. I mean, uh, are we going to become a nation of freelance journalists where, I have to put together, here's my science guy, here's my health guy, here's my market guy, here's my economics guy. That's a lot of work. Curating that is a lot of work. Absolutely. Which is what newspapers do, which is what media does. And so um, when I do my daily reads, I clip my way through 50 different sources each morning. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of repetitiveness. No, sure. I, I do a, a weekly substat, but I try and make it, so that's evergreen. So I want to ask you two questions before we finish. I want to ask you what you're driving. You live in New York or you live in? I live in the suburbs of New York City. So, so I live you, in the what, North Shore of Long Island. What What are you driving these days? Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Should I tell you what I drove last night or what I'm going to drive tomorrow uh, or, or later what's today? The, so what, What's in the garage? So I have a bunch of things in the garage. Um. I have uh, an FJ40, which uh, I have up for sale, a 1970s um, Toyota truck that I rebuilt in Columbia uh, and shipped up. It started in January 2020, and then it got halted during the pandemic. And then we restarted the following year. It came up in December. It took like three months to get through the port in Miami. Um, I'm actually selling that. I got that from my wife because we have a 2014 orange Jeep Rubicon. That I, it was a salvage title I bought a couple of years. Best 20 grand I ever spent. <laughs> and um, you go to buy a used Jeep before the pandemic. I don't mean during the pandemic. So my house is on the top of a hill, which is very twisty. And our all-wheel drive infinity 10 years ago, nine years ago, going up the hill in the rain, the, you can hear the tires slipping. And I'm like, I guess I need something a little beefier than this. So I went to buy a new Jeep. They're asking five grand over um list then i went to buy a huge jeep it's essentially the same price as new and i found a one year this was one of the car guys i knew was uh was a salvage title rebuilder he would buy these uh cars this was before sandy no this was after sandy so it was but it was a it's a 2013 that i bought in 2014 so it wasn't a sandy car it was after superstorm sandy um, and it was a salvage title due to flood. And so what he had done was he replaced all the electrical. There are like three electrical. Jeep is a, is a hamster wheel. It's a very simple. That's yes. what gives you your, your power. It's not like the BMW M cars that are just rolling computers. Um, that's another car that's in the garage. But um, so I bought a year old salvage title Jeep. It's pretty much the radio died five years later. But other than that, I've had no no issues. <laughs> Um, and the FJ was supposed to replace the Jeep and the wife is like, this FJ is a tin can. I'm going to stick with the Jeep. Okay. Um, I got a, I replaced a Porsche Macan three years ago with a BMW X4. I love the Macan S. My wife didn't like it. And the only problem I had is I went through a lot of tires and brakes because you drive it like a Porsche. Um, but it's a truck. So not, not tires, brakes. 
Um, that was replaced with a BMW X4, which just came off lease that I bought off lease. I wasn't planning on buying it off lease, but they go for now used uh, three years old. They're going for 55, 60 with 40,000 miles. I have 18,000 miles. It cost me 38 to buy. So I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll have to buy this. It's silly. Um, speaking of Porsches, uh, I'm not a crazy Porsche guy, um, but I like the idea of taking like a 70s, 80s era classic Porsche with 150,000 miles on it and pulling out the 3.0 or 3.2 flat six engine and replacing it with a Tesla engine, putting batteries up front. And, oh, yeah. And, yeah. So I'm in the middle of that right now. That's going to take about a year. That's I still haven't gotten the donor base car, but I'm in the queue for the guys that do that. So sometime in the spring, I have to get a car to them. Um, and then what's in the garage are my, well, I got the M6 convertible. Um, it's a 2014. It came off lease in Indianapolis in 2017. It was the only blue with an oyster interior that was available for sale. In fact, it was the only convertible with a stick shift a M6 that was available for sale. Um, I love buying cars for half of MSRP. So that's a pricey car that um, that I got pretty inexpensively. And then my other two pandemic cars were in the beginning of the pen. So I, I'm on cars and bids and bring a trailer and I'm on all the auction sites all the time. And I'm constantly bidding for cars. And I, I actually used to use my name. So I was the <laughs> my username was Ritholtz until a, a client called the office and asked one of my partners, why is Barry bidding a million dollars for a car? Are, are, are our fees too high? And I'm like, no, that's a five million dollar car. It was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't Paul Newman's 300 SL, but it was like something like that that I think was going to go for two or two and a half million. It ended up going for over three, and I'm like, no, I'm, if I get this car for a million dollars, I will sell this for three million and um, then go buy my own a lesser. SL. It's like, I, I'm so far off the market. So I had to change my name and I won't, will not reveal that because it's no. silly. Yeah. Um, but I don't have, I don't want to have to explain to a client why I'm bidding. So I'm always, I'm the other day I, I bid a uh, hundred thousand dollars for um, a McLaren that ended up going for 600 and I'm constantly bidding on cars and I'm usually way under the market. During uh, the early months of the pandemic, it was like end of March, early April, New York State Department of Motor Vehicles is closed. There's nobody on the road. And I bid on an Audi R8 with a gated shifter and the mid engine, um, big 400 plus horsepower engine. And I'm sitting in the backyard and my wife comes out and hands me the phone. She goes, it's uh, John from Utah. John from Utah. It's John from Utah. Hey, John, Barry, uh, congratulations on the car. Uh, which car? The Audi. And I'm like, oh, really? I'm shocked. I'm thinking I'm $20,000, $30,000 away from the market. So that was a pain in the ass to get insured. It was easy to get inspected. It was difficult to have it shipped because nobody was going anywhere. And DMV was closed. So, And it wasn't coming from like a dealer that could give me a paper mm, license sure. plate. So for the first two or three months I had that car, I was driving around with a stack of papers showing that it wasn't stolen. I didn't have registration. I didn't have plates, I, but I had insurance and inspection. And I had the whole conversation in my head mapped out with the cops. You don't understand. I'm paying insurance. I bought the car. DMV is closed. What am I supposed to do? I have to drive around. You never um, get stopped. And I never got stopped um, until way afterwards. Afterwards, I got I actually got stopped doing 37 and a 30 going downhill in neutral. And I said to the cop, look at this car. You can't give me a 37 and 30. I won't be able to show my face anywhere. Can you make it like 75 and a 30? It's it's embarrassing. 37 and 30. The guy laughed so hard. All right, go. Just, just um, you, you're such a salesperson, aren't you? No, no, it's not. By the way, last car. C2 Corvette, a 67 vet in blue and white that, you know, every time, every new car, every new project is down the rabbit hole. Like you become an expert in the space 
tell me what I need to know about this space and about this car. And so you buy the books. It is like a, it's called the black book for Corvette. It's every year, every option, yeah. every. And so I find the exact combination of what I want. Um, blue, white interior, stick shift, 327. I literally find it in Florida and it's double market price. And I call a guy and say, look, I'm not looking to be an asshole, but this car should be about half. Just what am I missing here? Just educate me. And the guy kind of sighs and he says, look, it's a consignment. It's for a guy that we're buying a Bugatti for, and he's selling this and he redid it. He put, you know, 200,000 into it. I'm like, listen, if you put 200,000 into a car, that should be 65, 75. It's no reason to tr ask, you know, uh, a crazy amount of money. I'm like, uh, tell you what, when he is becomes realistic and wants to sell it at market, I'm a buyer. But until then, uh, you know, that's double what it should be. And like four months later, I get a phone call. Hey, were you serious about that car? Yeah, if you're at market price, what do you, what would he take? You know what I offered last time? He's like, yes. I'm like, okay, let me get a shipper. <laughs> I'm going to send someone to inspect it. And if it checks out and next thing I know, I end up with, so I've run out of garage space. So I'm pretty much done. My options are stop buying cars, sell a car or build a garage. Those are my, my or move. You could move, you could move home. That's but you right. know, the funny thing is for someone who's an investor, everything I've ever bought, I could sell for more than I paid for. I don't go out. I don't leverage myself. Um, for a while, when I was, the, I was financing the cars at 2.9%, you know, a five-year loan, you pay them off in six months or a year. I was doing that because it just money was free. Now that money is free, uh, no longer free. The last car I bought, um, I just wrote a check and paid cash. Um, oh, my Panamera, my wife's Panamera. I bought her a car at auction, which I proceeded six months later to total at five miles an hour. Um the insurance company paid us 20 more than we paid for it. That's how much the market had gone up. Oh, yeah. No, it's been amazing. So, so tell me, oh. if, if I were a young student saying mm -hmm. I wanted to be Barry Ritholtz in the future, what book or books would you recommend to me? Well, first, I would talk you out of trying to be Barry Ritholtz in the future. That was a that would be a terrible, terrible mm -hmm. uh, mistake. But a couple of books, um, I'm going to give you two that are a little off the beaten path that, that aren't typical. One is Bull by, I think her name is Maggie Mayhar. Uh, it's a story of the 80s and 90s bull market. And it's just incredibly instructive. It just shows you how, you know, uh, markets evolve, how things change, how, how, how things progress. And it's how, how really important it is to be a uh, to understand what's going on in the world um, and to understand the value of of time. Um, so so that's one book. Um, and then the sort of the the market corollary to that is a book called Black Monday by Tim Metz that really gives you the history of what led up to the 87 crash and what happened before, during, and after. And I think those two books will give you as much market insight, even though it's stuff that happened 30, 40 years ago. It's it's all transferable forward. And, and then the, the other book would have to be something that would tell you about who we are and how we got that way. And, and why your brain is so ill-suited for making decisions in capital markets. And, you know, there's a million books, uh, Predictably Irrational, Thinking Fast and Slow. I could give you The Psychology of Money. There, there's tons and tons, but I want to go off the beaten path. So I'm going to say Last Ape Standing, which is a book about how uh, Homo sapiens managed to outwit all of the uh, other entities that were competing with um competing with human beings to actually be a uh, a, a species and i i found that to be um uh, just a fascinating science background it, it's sort of the predecessor book to all of the behavioral finance books that you've come to know and love and finally one more book that i i think is worth reading because it just comes back to the theme 
of rising to the moment when opportunity presents itself. And it's called How to Invent Everything, A Survival Guide for the Stranded Time Traveler. And, and the conceit of the book is we're a company, we make time travel machines and we rent it out and they're very safe. They rarely ever break down. But in the event that your time machine has you stuck in a different era, here's a handbook that will show you how to invent all the things that you'll need to survive. And it's essentially the history of human invention and ingenuity. And one of the most fascinating takeaways is how many inventions could have been invented decades or even centuries earlier if someone just stopped to think about it. It wasn't like the technology didn't exist. We just, no one said, well, put this spring with that lever and look what happens. Um, a, a similar book, but a very, a much more historically focused book is A, a World Lit Only by Fire, which just shows you uh, the downside of tribalism and uh, ideology and orthodoxy that you know, a thousand years humans didn't progress from like 400 to 1400 because this corrupt, at least in, in the Eastern world, the uh, in, in the Western world, in the East, they were progressing on their, their own. But um, Europe just froze for a thousand years when they should have been making massive progress because of this slavish addiction to a, a bad thinking process. It's funny, actually, on the subject of invention, it's funny how often something gets invented by two people around a very similar time, because it just the 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 nature of life has been such that this something comes into focus. And, you know, you would imagine, you know, you imagine that's like really odd. I, I, it's something I, I'm keen to study further. And tell me, you one of the things you've been asking people is what they're watching on Netflix. What was your favorite and your worst recommendation from a guest? I don't remember who told me what. So this may or may not be from a guest or it may or not be something I stumbled onto myself. And there is no favorite, but I'll give you three favorites. I, I, I miss Mad Men when it first came around. So we yeah. streamed that. And I literally had to call someone who I knew lived through that era and said, Hey, how over the top is this depiction of Mad Men? And they're like, dead on, absolutely accurate. I'm like, really? It looks like a wild exaggeration of racism, um, anti-Semitism, misogyny, ho homophobia. They're like, no, that's how it was. I'm like, oh, all right. Um, so that was that was fascinating, fascinating, really well done. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's must watch. And then uh, one from Amazon, one from Netflix, uh, Mozart in the jungle was just amazing. Just if you like music, just spectacular. Um, just spectacular about a South American conductor who comes to the New York Philharmonic. And I just loved it. And then a surprise that I just stumbled onto by accident was something called the magicians, which started off in, in one direction and just kind of went in a totally different direction. And, Really, really fascinating. There's, there's a list of 100, everything from The Expanse to, you know, The Crown. I, I But I don't want to give people stuff that they probably see. Oh, no, that's been fantastic. And listen, it's been so interesting talking to you. I've been a, you know, massive fan of the podcast uh, for for years. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm on podcast number 15, 16 now. And I, you know, I can't imagine doing 500. I, I've find it very, very difficult thing to do. And you've made it incredibly easy. Thank you so much for coming on. I will put it in the show notes where people can find you. Is there any anything that you would like to say before we finish? I don't know. You got another hour? I I could keep doing that. You know, the in the beginning, the one I'm gonna say something to you as a podcaster. So first, like everything else in the world, preparation, hard work, practice just makes you better. Yeah. I'm glad you like masters in business. I am not being, you know, this is not a fake humility or a, a artificial, you know, oh, look how coy he is pretending he sucked. The first, like, I don't know, 30, 40, they're unlistenable. Every week, Al Mayers, who used to be the head of Bloomberg Radio and Television, just retired this month, he would pull me aside and he would basically, you know, mentor me about radio and say, now, I know you have a list of topics you want to get to and a list of questions you want to ask. But when a guest tells you they murdered their wife and she's buried in the basement, 
you can't just say, uh-huh, and go on to the next question. You have to follow. You have to listen to what they're saying and follow up on that. And I was like, so, wait, I got to listen to the guests. I'm not just reading a list of questions. Okay, let me let me see if I can. Um, so that's number one. And, and number two, you know, you would be surprised at how organic and natural it becomes 200 episodes in, 150 episodes in, because- like everything else, it's a skill. And the more you learn how to do it, the more you practice, the better you get. So my first, I don't know, uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say 30, 40, 50 were just horrific. I'm glad the first 38 are not on iTunes. They're on my site. And I don't think you can find them without really digging in. They, they were really bad. And hey, you know, it's a gradual curve. And then the hockey stick part comes when you're really prepped you know your guest as well as anybody does and you're comfortable working on the fly and you have just uh, you know if, if i go into an interview and i don't know the answers to each of the questions i've written down or each of the topics i have um better than they do I, I, i'm unprepared and i failed and and i think guests appreciate that no i, I mean i I do. I spend a lot of time on on prep. My the podcast that I'm do that is. Uh, so I do a monthly podcast, and the one that's current in September as we're recording this is with Sir Clive Woodward, who managed the England rugby team and took them from number six in the world to number one. And it was quite amazing because I hadn't appreciated how much overlap there was between sport and business. And he mm. really explains it incredibly well. But he's written two books, had a biography written about him, and has done dozens of podcasts. And unlike you, I listen to the podcast because I don't want to ask the same questions. So I just I just interviewed Carson Block last week. And Carson's been on everybody's podcast. He's been right. Members, he's been on everyone. And everybody always asks him, well, how did you get into the industry? So I said to Carson, let's not talk about that because you've you've – it's a, it's a fascinating story, but you've done it uh, many, many times. But um, out of respect for your guest, you've got to spend a lot of time preparing and you've got to go in prepared. But Barry, it's been a pleasure talking to you. If you're ever in London, I hope you're going to look me up. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I wasn't sure of what to expect when Barry agreed to come on the show. I hadn't realized that he'd made his name as a market pundit and that he would have so many stories to tell outside of the podcast. It was so interesting to chat to him and I came away wondering if perhaps as a podcast host, you've got a lot to say, but you don't get the opportunity to say it. One thing's for sure though, I'll be dead before I hit 400 podcasts. If you enjoyed this, you'll be pleased to hear we have more episodes planned. Subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss them. Thank you for listening.